uh, here at UST at the Division of Public Policy. Uh, over to you, Nabaha. Thank you, Donald. So I will. I hope everyone can see my slides. Um, I will get going on um, the first few slides. I start with a background about public research universities. Um, so these universities in Hong Kong have um, a strong reputation, and because of their uh, reputation and other characteristics I'll go through, they have the potential to play a really important role in accelerating uh, the development of innovation and technology in Hong Kong. They can act um, as an engine for innovation and innovative and technologically related growth. And the research capacity of these universities in Hong Kong is well recognized in global university rankings such as QS and the Times Higher Education. However, despite their excellent academic reputation and their high research capacity, their contribution to Hong Kong's public research to the development of innovation and technology locally is relatively low. So this is a bit of a conundrum that we're facing, that we have these excellent universities of high repute, but the um, impact that they have on the development of innovation and technology locally is uh, questionable. So while research universities in Hong Kong are ranked highly in global university rankings, their performance in technology and innovation is not as strong as it could be. On this slide, what we have is a list of cities across the world and uh, with a number of universities that are ranked in the QS top 100 as of 2019. And as you can see, Hong Kong ranks number one. We have five universities in 2019 that are ranked in the top, in the QS world top 100 universities. However, of the top 100, one, sorry, top 100 world innovative universities, which goes to speak to their impact on innovation and technological development in Hong Kong, we have zero. So this is the conundrum that we're trying to investigate, that despite having a large number of highly ranked universities, five in a small location, 1,100 square kilometers, that is Hong Kong, the number of those universities that are ranked in the top 100 innovative universities as ranked by Reuters in 2019 is, is zero. And you can compare that number with other cities. For example, we have more universities ranked in the top 100 than Seoul. Seoul only has three. However, they have four that are ranked in the top 100 innovative universities. So while the expenditure on R&D in Hong Kong is relatively low, higher education institutes have received a significant amount of funding for research and development. So overall, Hong Kong spends about 1% of its GDP on research and development annually. Of that 1%, the majority um, is taken up by universities. So Hong Kong spends slightly more than the OECD average. Specifically, Hong Kong spends 0.43% of its GDP on higher education, research and development. And that is slightly more, as I said, than the OECD average, which is 0.1%. But then um, the OECD average for gross expenditure on R&D is 2.5%, which is much more than the 0.93% that Hong Kong spends on R&D. So basically what I'm trying to say is here, Hong Kong spends a, a relatively low amount on research and development annually. However, its emphasis upon universities is disproportionately high in that relatively small amount of spending as a proportion of GDP that Hong Kong exerts on research and development. Okay, so in terms of R&D spending, Hong Kong is poor, but all, of the amount that it does spend on R&D, its emphasis upon universities is high, higher than the OECD average, whereas the overall expenditure on R&D is much lower than the OECD average. Here's the slide that gives you an assessment of public research universities in Hong Kong. Uh, we look at the proof of concept funding scheme in CityU, ChineseU, PolyU, HKUFC, and Hong Kong U. These are the five universities that we focused on. Um, and the key thing to note from this slide is that although these universities have proof of uh, concept funding schemes, um, faculty tenure uh, does not take into consideration that aspect. Um, overall, generally speaking, the overall trend is that knowledge transfer um, and proof of funding scheme, proof of funding concept schemes are not taken into consideration. They're not part of the incentives, formal incentive structure that universities have in Hong Kong. 
Um, each of these universities, these five universities I've just mentioned, have strong technology transfer offices. So, so they are beginning to emphasize knowledge transfer from the ivory tower of the universities into society. And each of these knowledge transfer offices have been beefed up in recent years. So, for example, in CityU, the organizational structure is that they have a knowledge transfer office. They have a KT representative in each school, a knowledge transfer representative across the university. Uh, they have a company called CDU Enterprises Limited, and they have another one, CDU Research Limited, which is focused on licensing and commercialization of CDU patents. And this pattern is repeated uh, roughly across each of the five universities that were the purview of our investigation. If we are to assess uh, public research universities in Hong Kong, um, the commercialization route is that um, is roughly similar. Um, it's not identical, but it, it is quite similar. Uh, CityU, for example, explicitly promotes licensing and discourages spin-off formation by faculty. It encourages startup formation among students. PolyU licensing is preferred uh, as a preferred commercialization route. Stringent requirements for spin-off formation by faculty, and for HKUST, City, uh, Chinese U, and Hong Kong U that uh, there are favorable policies for spin-off formation and also for licensing. If we look at uh, spin-off and startups in particular, uh, and we assess how each of these five universities do in that respect, we see that um, at, at CityU, the um, CityU involves, uh, spin-offs involves technology, new venture founded by at least a staff or former staff or student or alumni to CityU, and it champions CDU uh, intellectual property patents. But there's no institutional ownership and the IP is only licensed. At Chinese U, the spin-offs are companies which the university has shares in, and they take advantage of the startup fund offered by the ITC, specifically the Tissue TSSU uh, startup fund and companies. At our own university, HKUST, uh, spin-off companies are um, with or without university shareholding. They're affiliated to HKUST. So once again, alumni, students, staff, and so forth. They're incubated and coached by entrepreneurship programs based in Clearwater Bay campus. So the entrepreneurship program and the incubation program at Clearwater Bay campus is strong. Um, so we see a roughly um, uh, similar picture across these five universities which some, with some important subtle differences. On this slide, we see if, uh, we have a comparison of targeted and achieved figures for patent applications in five the universities that we're looking at, CDU, Chinese U, Hong Kong U, UST, and PolyU. And the main thing to note is um, that um, the number of patents uh, applications over the years from 2009 to two, uh, 2009, 2010 to 2020, 21 has been increasing quite rapidly. Um, Chinese U um, stands out, followed by HKUST for the number of patents achieved, uh, followed by uh, PolyU and uh, Hong Kong U, which are quite similar depending on the year that you're looking at. But the trend has been a, a, a heavy emphasis on the number of patent applications from each of these five universities. Here we compare uh, uh, the figures for number of licenses that have been granted across the five universities, once again from 2010 to 2020, and we see some patterns emerging here. Um, CityU has um, basically given up licensing over the last few years. Hong Kong U has, has seen a steady increase in the number of licenses granted. Uh, HKUST has also seen a steady increase. Um, uh, you know, it's it's not remarkable, but it's been it's been there. Uh, PolyU has also seen a steady increase in the number of licensing granted. The main takeaway from this slide is that uh, each of the five universities have um, been gradually over the last ten years increasing um, the number of licensing licenses granted, except for the City University of Hong Kong. On this slide, we have a comparison of targeted and achieved figures for the number of economically active spin-off companies. So here we see also that CityU has been not dormant, but relatively stagnant, I would say. Chinese U has um, also seen a slight drop in number in the number of economically active spin-off companies over the last few years. Hong Kong U has seen a, a market increase from only a few in the in the early part of the 
2010s to, to dozens of spin-off companies recently. Um, HKUST has done by far the best, and um, it is matched by PolyU with hundreds of spin-off companies over the last three or four years. So you can see some differences here that the emphasis on spin-offs from HKUST and PolyU has been remarkably um, greater as compared to the, the earlier three universities. On this slide, we see the percentage of inter-organizational linkages. This is important because it tells us the extent to which um, the universities are connected to other uh, actors and players within Hong Kong's innovation ecosystem. And the inter-organizational linkages we're looking at is other local universities, local public research organizations, local companies, industry, and then finally, foreign organizations. So for each of the uh, five universities, um, oh, here we include Baptist U as well. Uh, we're looking at the number of the percentage of interorganizational linkages as divided by universities, public research organizations, um, companies, and also foreign organizations. And we can see the numbers here from 2001 to 2006, the first period, 2007 to 2012, the second period, and 2013 to 2018, the third period. And you can see some really marked increases in the number of inter-organizational linkages. And this has been a result of several factors that my colleagues will get into as we proceed throughout this presentation. The, the extent to which universities are being linked to other actors within Hong Kong's innovation system is indeed increasing, generally speaking, with the passage of time, as it can be evidenced from these uh, three periods that we have here. Um, and here on this slide, we have a specialization of Hong Kong university spin-offs. Um, identified uh, from UI co-publication. So this is meant to give us another insight, another angle to understand the extent to which universities and industry, one specific actor in the innovation ecosystem, an important actor in the innovation eco ecosystem, are collaborating with one another. How strong are the university industry links as manifested in co-publications? Co and here you can see that uh, the number of co-publications over the period of 2009 to 2018 is not that strong. Um, HKU is probably does the best um, in, in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, but overall there's been a, I think we can, the, the main takeaway from the slide is that the number of university industry co-publications, scientific collaboration between universities and industry partners is relatively weak in Hong Kong. And I think that speaks to the generally low level of sophistication of industry actors in Hong Kong, um, um, as well as the university's willingness to engage with them. Okay, um, here I believe I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Professor Shen Wu. So I will um, allow Professor Wu to take over. Should I? Um, Thank start? you. Yeah, maybe I can share um, the slides from my end. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to uh, continue the discussion uh, with uh, some global comparison. Uh, like Professor Sharif mentioned earlier, uh, Hong Kong um, Public Research University uh, ranked very well in terms of uh, academic reputation and the research capacity. Um, but if you look at uh, the ranking um, on the, you know, most uh, the world's most innovative university, uh, then Hong Kong, none of Hong Kong University uh, is ranked among uh, top 100 here. Yeah. So, you know, I just uh, sort of uh, give you a sense about uh, these uh, university. Well, what are these universities? Top, top ranked university uh, in terms of uh, most innovative university. A lot of uh, these university uh, are also uh, academically very strong university. Like if you look at the many of these top top 10 university, they are very strong uh, in terms of academic reputation and research. But there are uh, university uh, that ranks may not rank very high based on academic uh, uh, reputation, uh, but they're doing very well uh, in terms of technology innovation, like uh, uh, KU Levin, for example, and uh, also the uh, Paul Han University of Science and Technology in South Korea uh, are such uh, example. Uh, so give you a bit more um, 
background about uh, uh, this ranking. Um, this is uh, a bit different from a QS ranking, um, which is focusing on uh, publication and academic uh, reputation only. Uh, if you look at uh, the list of indicators used for uh, the innovative university, you can find that uh, uh, vast majority of these indicators are focusing on the performances related to technology innovation, technology uh, transfer, like a patent, uh, patent success, global patent, uh, patent citation, and uh, you know percentage industry collaboration article, industry article citation impact, and so on and so forth. So, so this is a quite different from the uh, the QS uh, ranking, which is focusing on academic um, reputation. Um, so. We, uh, we actually uh, make some comparison um, by um, selecting some of the uh, university, regional and the global uh, university that are included uh, in this uh, innovative university ranking. Uh, if you look at the, especially uh, outside the region, right, we have uh, the, uh, we, we have universities uh, from Middle East, Europe and uh, North America, but also we have also, uh, the university perform very well in this regard in the regions. There are, you know, Tsinghua University, University of Tokyo, Seoul National University, and National University of Singapore. These are universities in the region that are, are really have uh, done very well with regard to technology innovation and technology transfer area. So uh, for comparison purpose, we also uh, look at uh, uh, some of the university uh, in the regions, so in the global, uh, in the Great Bay areas. We uh, choose some university in Shenzhen uh, for comparison purpose. We also uh, include uh, a couple of university in Shanghai uh, for that comparison. Right? So, so, so this is just to uh, get some ideas about what are the other university globally and regionally are doing uh, in technology innovation, technology transfer areas um, to, to, to help the development of a technology innovation hub in different localities. So, so in this uh, study, uh, not only we look at uh, the university, but we also look at uh, what we call the pairing right, hubs. Right? So, so each of the university, there are some specific hub linked to them. Right? Uh, so if you look at University of Tokyo, then uh, we also look at uh, Tokyo um, as the technology innovation hub. Uh, then when we study uh, the Seoul National University, we also look at uh, Seoul uh, as a technology innovation hub, so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, these are uh, some of the uh, uh, findings uh, from this uh, global and regional comparison um, across uh, different universities as well as uh, different uh, technology innovation hub. Right? So, so this is just so we give you some example uh, of some of the findings, um, uh, Worth, worth noting. Uh, in the University of Washington, right, they actually uh, perform very well in terms of uh, technology innovation and te uh, technology transfer area. So, so some of the uh, some of the uh, experiences in the University of Washington uh, include, you know, uh, UW received largest federal funding for research among public university, quite good, uh, good achievement, and the net licensing income is shared equally among yeah, inventor host department and the university. Right? So this is actually to provide more incentive um, across different units within the universities uh, uh, from the, uh, from, from, from the uh, income generated from the technology innovation efforts. Um, in the case of uh, the University of California at Berkeley, I, one of the things uh, that quite important is that uh, the University of California system overall has also a dimensional match for evaluating license performance, uh, which enable a better appreciation of uh, inter, uh, interaction uh, uh, between university and the industry firm, as well as uh, the challenge, challenges that went into the negotiation during the licensing process. Um, KU Levin is actually uh, performing extremely well um, uh, in the uh, most, uh, uni uh, most innovative university ranking. And uh, there's a, you know, quite a lot of lessons from that university. So some of the some of the no uh, um aspect include uh, faculty performance assessment approach that is highly tailored and individualized in accordance with the fa faculty members' track record and activity. Right? So it's not really one size fit all kind of uh, faculty assessment uh, process here, but rather than you know 
rather highly tailored and individualized. So, so that is actually uh, one of the one of the success of uh, KU Levin. Um, we also uh, look at other uh, global uh, universities that are ranked very high in innovative uh, uh, university ranking. Um, for the Imperial College London, for example, one of the experts quite important is also in a way in, in the area of the faculty uh, uh, performance assessment, right? So ICL's explicit recognition of faculty achievement in KTM TT activity uh, in the tenure policy is, is worth considering. So, so this is some, you know, uh, really we, when, when we look at this comparison, we compare some experiences in this probably research university in Hong Kong and try to find some similarity and the, and the differences here. So in the case of uh, Seoul National University, uh, we find that uh, um, that Seoul National University's experiment with a flexible policy of a one day per week activities and the recruitment of faculty focusing on industry university uh, cooperation. These are new efforts made by the university and they in part explain why uh, the university has played a uh, very important role uh, in the industry university collaborations. Okay, so um, as I mentioned um, before, we're also looking at uh, from the perspective of uh, the locality, right? so the different uh, the role played by local government in enhancing the technology innovation hub. So, um, you know, in the in the case of uh, Beijing, uh, there's a regulation imposed by Beijing municipality clarify the role of knowledge transfer. In fact, the performance assessment, right? this is quite remarkable in a way that uh, the city government actually um, focus on a lot you know, in terms of uh, having knowledge transfer as part of the faculty performance assessment across different university uh, in, in, the, uh, um, in the city. So that's quite important. And, uh, and also, if you look at uh, uh, Tokyo, uh, Seoul and Singapore, um, there's all, you know, one, one of the common aspects is that uh, some form of uh, bell door law uh, has actually been introduced uh, to uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in the last uh, you know, um, 20, 20 years or so, um, you know, different time period. But, but this has been, I, I think, has been quite important aspect in, in contributing to the technology transfer development uh, in, in these localities. And, and also, uh, we look at uh, uh, some of specific technology innovation hub from the, uh, the perspective of a university industry collaboration, right? We look at uh, uh, Tel Aviv, London, uh, Seattle, and uh, Silicon Valley. Like I mentioned before, we have this pairing arrangement. Not only look at university, but looking at also look at health. So um, one example uh, or lesson um, from Tel Aviv, for example, close collaboration with being off with direct or indirect linkages uh, to the uh, Tel Aviv uh, University, um, whether to uh, uh, the research firm in the university alone, or in collaboration with other institutions. That's one of the aspects that uh, actually explicitly uh, as a policies uh, uh, from, from the Tel Aviv, um, uh, Tel Aviv uh, the technology hubs. And in the case of London, uh, active collaboration uh, activities uh, related to social engagement both of the universities supported by abundant value, uh, venture capital and the incubators resources here. So this is actually quite important in terms of development of uh, uh, technology innovation hub because not only this is not only about uh, technology per se, but also about uh, other resources, venture capital uh, being one of them, incub incubated resources or other kind of resources. But more importantly, that also uh, require a significant basis uh, to grow entrepreneurship here, which is actually can be achieved by um, engaging a variety of the university in the city, not only uh, so-called the uh, research university. Right, so, so these are some of the um, regional uh, or the global experiences in the university uh, industry uh, collaboration here. So uh, there are also um, some lessons joined um, from some of the regional uh, hubs, uh, technology innovation hubs uh, in Beijing, Shenzhen, Tokyo, and Seoul. Right, so, so, so just give some um, example of uh, uh, what are the key factors leading to the significant development of industrial technology innovation activity uh, in those localities. Right? Uh, in the case of Beijing, uh, the university actually engaged in scientific research efforts with various type of enterprises, right, ranging from state-owned enterprises to foreign multinational uh, and the university spin-off. So which this is actually quite different in the, uh, 
when you compare the case of Hong Kong, uh, where much of the uh, research is actually start and end at the, the university, right? Majority of, of R&D funding are used by the university and uh, you don't really see a lot of a contribution uh, from the industry. So, so that's the one uh, is quite important uh, to uh, draw some lesson uh, from places like Beijing. And in the case of Singapore, uh, the driven per primarily by the uh, foreign nationals uh, investment uh, in the uh, uh, 1980s and then first of all, 1990s. Um, and, and then uh, more recently, uh, it basically benefited from significant investment of the public sector through the public research organization, uh, such as ASTAR. So, so these are some of uh, <clears throat> noteworthy um, the aspect uh, that other technology hub has been doing enforcing the university industry collaborations. Okay, I think I'll um, just uh, stop uh, uh, my sharing here and uh, I'll, um, I'll pass the floor to uh, Professor Anthony Chang um, for, for discussing policy uh, recommendation and uh, wrapping up the session. Okay, thank you, uh, Shun. Uh, let me share my, my screen. Uh, Okay. Uh, okay. I hope you can all see uh, the slide. Uh, uh, Anthony, maybe you want to put on to uh, share yeah. screen mode. Yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, the screen presentation mode. Yeah, 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 you're there now. Okay, thanks. Okay. You got it? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, it should be the previous one. Okay. Oh, sorry. It doesn't move. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, our, our research project is a special public policy research project. So we are not just looking at conceptual issues, but also how our findings can inform uh, what could be done in terms of policy, in terms of uh, practices. And uh, right now, of course, uh, uh, innovation and technology is very much uh, talk of the tongue. Government is putting increasing emphasis on it, uh, Hong Kong to become an international uh, hub for INT, and even schools are talking about uh, STEM education. So what about our public research universities? You have heard from Professor Sharif and Professor Wu, uh, 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 their, their relative performance, how uh, they compare with each other internally, and also how uh, Hong Kong uh, universities uh, compare with uh, universities elsewhere, in other cities, in other uh, hubs. Now, uh, Overall speaking, of course, our research is, uh, in fact, uh, contains a lot of details, a lot of useful findings. But just try to uh, gain a sense of the overall impression, the overall findings. So um, one way to do it is to categorize uh, the role of universities uh, into five, into four here. One relate, the first relates to production of knowledge and technology. The second to the transfer and exchange of knowledge and technology. The third one to develop to groom talent, of course, including uh, education of uh, tertiary level students and research students, and also uh, contribution to uh, social development to provide a societal uh, platform. Now, if you look at the, the functions and professions potential ways of contribution according uh, to these uh, four different aspects, uh, we can actually um, see that uh, there are things that could be done in terms of enhancing the existing uh, policies to uh, 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 introduce uh, relevant schemes and to improve uh, some practices, whether uh, in the universities or uh, uh, in government directions and policies. Now, for production, of course, uh, the importance of basic research, and Hong Kong actually is doing uh, very well. 
uh, our public research universities are all world class, the top uh, 100, even top 50. Uh, but we think that there should be uh, improved uh, performance-based funding schemes uh, to strengthen uh, basic research. And uh, our research areas should be attractive, uh, whether to big corporations, multinationals, or SMEs, so that there's a wider range of uh, potential for application eventually. For transfer and exchange of knowledge and technology, uh, the importance uh, lies in commercialization. Now, uh, our universities are all uh, becoming more active in patenting and licensing. However, in terms of spin-off, the performance varies according to what is reported earlier. So how could uh, uh, commercialization be supported and encouraged? So we think that uh, the funding scheme, the grants, the funds for R&D uh, should cover all stages of the process from basic to uh, application. And uh, there should be institutional reforms within the universities, uh, some dealing with uh, legal issues, IP, and some with uh, um, other aspects of uh, making better use of resources, including uh, appointment and promotion policies, for example. And there should be more uh, cross-boundary, cross-border cross collaboration with other countries, within the mainland cities. And of course, uh, uh, there should be uh, recognition of the importance of complementarity. In terms of talent development, uh, this is uh, uh, this should be a more uh, a broader based, uh, broader range uh, 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 initiative. And um, the importance is to attract talent and to retain talent and to uh, equip the talent with entrepreneurial skills. Finally, uh, in terms of contribution to social development, we think that this is a very important role of universities. Uh, they are not just uh, ivory towers. So universities should display leadership and expertise uh, in the local policy making process, in uh, charting a regional vision, and to uh, support social development. Social, in this sense, covers all aspects of development of society, including uh, economic or even cultural. Now, funding has to uh, encourage uh, more interdisciplinary projects, and uh, uh, universities should uh, behave, should be uh, able to provide platforms uh, so as to create collaborative and consensus space. Okay, now uh, some key messages from our report, from our study with uh, perhaps uh, 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 policy applications. At the university level, during our study, we found that there's this ongoing debate between uh, of uh, KT, knowledge transfer versus academic excellence. Of course, it depends on how you define academic, but somehow there's this uh, 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 debate. Uh, people do not feel entirely comfortable with how to position uh, KT, for example, within the overall uh, scheme of things of what universities are doing. Anxieties or um, doubts regarding appointment, promotion, uh, tenure, uh, whether the performance indicators uh, are really conducive uh, to Have we lost Professor Jan? Yeah, let me try to get him. Yeah, we seem to have lost him. Yeah, I think on this slide, what uh, Professor Zheng, if I could try to fill in um, temporarily, was trying to say is that uh, there is this tension or or this dilemma about uh, what the universities should attempt to prioritize in trying to achieve their mission. Recently, knowledge transfer has become a bigger and bigger issue. But to some extent, um, 
that may not um, contradict the achievement of academic excellence, but at least their incentives have to be different if academic excellence is to be pursued alongside uh, knowledge transfer. Specifically, in appointment and promotion policies, knowledge transfer has to be included in a meaningful way so as to properly incentivize faculty to pursue both knowledge transfer and academic excellence side by side. And furthermore, commercialization routes oriented beyond patenting and licensing have to be enforced so that there is an engagement of various innovation actors in knowledge transfer because knowledge transfer extends beyond just the sciences and engineering. Knowledge transfer can also and should incorporate the medical school, the architecture school, the business school, the law faculty, the wide variety of humanities and social sciences, which do not necessarily come to mind when we think of just the narrower form of technology transfer. Um, and university industry collaboration and scientific and technical activities has to be pursued, but that has to be just one part of the broader agenda to achieve knowledge transfer, which, as I've just mentioned previously, goes much beyond and is broader than, um, uh, than, than just the narrow form of knowledge transfer. Um, I think Professor Cheng is back, so he can no, we still. Over. Uh, we, oh. we can see him, but we can't hear him <laughs> for some strange reason. Okay. Yeah. So I think, here, yeah. Yeah. I think here uh, the, the key messages that we wanted to convey, which can translate into specific policy implications, are that funding support at all stages of R&D development, particularly for early stage university research, has to be reevaluated because uh, we do not deny the importance of funding basic R&D. But that basic R&D uh, support has to be commensurate with applied R&D, with commercialization, with marketization, so as to be more fruitfully able to bring the basic knowledge that the universities excel in creating to the market, to society, to people who are, who are supposed to benefit from the university's presence in the innovation ecosystem. Furthermore, there's been a, a huge, huge uh, press recently among the uh, officials of the Hong Kong SAR government to attract and re retain global talent and build a sustainable local talent pipeline. This is an important factor because it aligns with what we are saying in two ways. First, that funding support has to extend beyond just um, the narrow R&D, basic research and development. It has okay. to... Uh... Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, Anthony, we couldn't hear you um, for the can last. Can you so, hear so, me? Yeah, we can hear you now. So, you uh, you want to wrap up? Yeah. Okay, I don't know what happens. It's okay. Uh, uh, Nabaha filled in for you while you were off. You were, while you were while we couldn't hear you. Yeah. Better? Yeah. Okay. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so um, about uh, retaining talent, uh, apart from hygiene factors, uh, the, the living conditions, uh, uh, remuneration, R&D funding, all these uh, uh, material support, we also need room for creativity. We need the motivating factors and uh, the room for application of ideas, for example. That's why uh, collaboration with industry is so important. So government can play a role in facilitating more diverse channels with industry. That's something perhaps individual universities cannot do alone. Uh, ultimately, the government should review how to strengthen uh, further uh, such collaboration so that uh, the uh, uh, ecosystem for uh, innovation could be made more vibrant. Universities are important, vital, but they are not the only contributors to the development of innovation hubs. We need a stronger government, industry, universities regime. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, uh, a few wrapping up reflections based on our study. First, uh, should public research universities in Hong Kong take up a pioneer or lead uh, driving role in accelerating the development of a global INT hub in the GBA? Of course, uh, at the end of the day, of government must play a very important uh, advocating steering role. However, on the ground, can universities become uh, pioneers uh, taking the initiative? But that involves how universities see their role, uh, particularly with respect to what have, they have been doing traditionally as academic institutions. Compared to research universities active in R&D and KT in the hubs elsewhere, as what uh, Professor Wu has uh, described, why have Hong Kong universities not been able to deliver better results, despite several of them ranking among the world's top 50 and excelling in basic research? And that is, I think, a, a very important question for us to ponder. And for Hong Kong as a whole, as a hub city, we are a hub city in terms of uh, transport connectivity, in terms of trade, in terms of many other things. But in terms of R&D, INF, why it seems that Hong Kong is lagging behind others? So are there institutional factors, structural factors uh, that we might need to pay more attention to? Uh, and to move forward, uh, we, we should look at uh, initiatives, improvements at three different levels. First, uh, the university level, university-specific improvements, as what we have described. Secondly, uh, the future directions of government policies and government practices in uh, facilitating uh, improvements. And finally, um, to reshape and restructure the ecosystem. Again, uh, that is something that government uh, must play a very important role. So I will stop here so that there could be some discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Professor Wu, Professor Sharif, and uh, uh, Professor Cheong for that very rich and insightful set of presentations. Uh, so maybe I'll start the uh, Q&A rolling. And for our participants, please feel free to uh, type your questions in the Q&A box, uh, and I will, I will read them out. Uh, so maybe I'll start by asking uh, Professor Sharif, who presented a very interesting set of uh, data on Hong Kong's relatively low R&D spending. Uh, even though within that low R&D spending, uh, uh, public uh, universities, public research universities get a disproportionate share. Uh, what, 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 why do you think that is besides the fact that, besides the obvious reasons, right, that government, you know, just, uh, or, or that economic actors here, as well as government, uh, don't spend as much. On, uh, are, are there certain structural factors? I mean, what I can think of is that, uh, A, Hong Kong doesn't have a defense industry. Uh, in many countries, much or at least a significant share of research funding is for uh, developing defense, uh, the, the defense industry. Second, more, and perhaps more importantly, uh, Hong Kong doesn't have a manufacturing base. All the other places where uh, R&D spending is at least 3% of GDP tends to have relatively high shares of uh, manufacturing. Uh, the service industry, which, you know, uh, Hong Kong is entirely a services economy, tends to spend a lot less on R&D. Uh, so, so to what extent, uh, Nabaha, do you think that Hong Kong's uh, relatively low share of R&D spending as a percentage of GDP reflects certain structural uh, factors? And, and if, if we say that these are the, the constraints are structural as opposed to policy, then changing the structure obviously takes much is, is a much more involved effort than just changing policy. Yeah, I completely agree with you that to the largest to the large extent it is structural, and the two reasons that you mentioned, the absence of manufacturing and the absence of a military sector, explain the structure. But there is one policy element that I might hazard a guess to say is relevant here, and that is the following: Hong Kong's policymakers do not have a tradition of trying to promote. R&D spending, even when there was manufacturing, and I'm talking about 1970s, 1980s, very early on, 40, 50 years ago. And the only lever that Hong Kong's policymakers know to push, pull, or, or however you want to manipulate is to channel uh, their R&D spending 
through the universities, which are public universities. So whenever there's a call for Hong Kong's uh, policymakers to increase their R&D spending, to, to focus more on innovation and technology, to turn towards INT, to, to strengthen the, its innovation system, um, for a number of reasons, in, and one of those reasons is, is the lack of you know, um, uh, understanding of how to go about doing it, the first reaction is to say, great, okay, we want to improve our innovation system. We don't intervene. We have a policy of non-interventionism, po a positive non-interventionism, laissez-faire, big market, small government, what have you. The only way that they know how to intervene, the only way that they feel comfortable intervening is through the channel of the universities. So that is a policy-related factor. The structural factors, I completely agree with you. I have nothing to add there. But I think the policy-related factor is that whenever Hong Kong's policymakers feel a pressure or a need to improve R&D spending, they do so indirectly by increasing the share of spending that the tertiary education sector um, exerts. And, you know, um, our secondary education sector and the primary education sector is relatively poor as compared to the OECD average, whereas the tertiary education sector receives far more money than, than many OECD countries. And that, I think, is a reflection of a policy-related issue. Uh, yes and no, right? I mean, it is a policy in the sense that this is a, a deliberate decision that they have channeled the R&D funding to university. That's, that's a policy decision. But it also reflects the fact that nobody else seems or nobody else is really engaged in, in doing R&D. So that's a structural constraint. And it seems to me that this is not going to change overnight. Uh, Absolutely. So, but, but, which, is what, yeah, which is why I think the structural reasons are predominant. The policy yeah. reasons are, are, are the smaller factor. Are the smaller factor. So which leads me to my second question, which I can direct to any of you. Uh, I mean, uh, Shun, Professor Wu had a very insightful slides, which you didn't have enough time, I think, to go through them on the varieties of university industry collaboration. And it seems it's quite diverse out there. And it's, it, it, you know, it's not just a, a homogenous picture of universities taking the lead. Some In some cities, surprisingly, in Silicon Valley, this innovation hub, Silicon Valley, uh, Stanford and Berkeley play a very significant role. In others, it's industry that take the lead. So it seems to me that you know, there is no one-size-fits-all approach one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to developing this uh, research, innovation, and enterprise ecosystem. So I, I wonder if all, uh, any of you, you all would like to chip in on which model do you think when we think about restructuring and uh, creating this ecosystem, what, what sort of characteristics should Hong Kong strive for? What kind Is there a model we should be uh, uh, striving for? Or would we, would we have to create our uniquely Hong Kong uh, innovation system? Uh, maybe Professor Wu, I'll get you to kick, start the ball rolling. Okay, yeah. So uh, thank you for this question. I think uh, uh, no, if you look at uh, the experiences overseas, and uh, we we might uh, you know expect in some country like in the United States, for example, that people uh, consider that you know mar market really dominant, right? People uh, don't really don't really associate with a, a, a government intervention a lot, right? In the in the case of the science technology development, uh, in the case of U.S. But uh, you know our um, our research actually. Um, the view uh, that in many uh, uh, many important areas of uh, uh, technology advance, right, uh, such as you know AI and uh, many other areas, actually federal funding has actually played a very uh, important role uh, in in getting many of the areas uh, started here, right. So so this is the one area where um, it has to be long term, uh, which means that you don't necessarily see the direct. Uh, uh, impact of uh, what you're doing in terms of government, right? They take a long time to really uh, uh, have, have uh, you know, kind of a significant, yeah, uh, see significant effect. The other thing is also, you have to be prepared to take risk that some of this investment, a lot of funding, may not necessarily yield the outcomes that you look for, right? So, so the government have to kind of, in a way, deal with uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, you know, the, some of the failures uh, of lack of success of the, uh, this this funding scheme. So so these are two aspects I think that uh, you know uh, offers a quite important lesson for Hong Kong uh, in a way that you have to take a very long term approach and uh, because the benefit may come in you know decades and several decades later. Right? This the second is uh, to deal with uh, the risk. You know that a lot of investment may just uh, basically um, for the you know uh, try and errors, and then you have to you have to accept a certain rate of failures uh, in, in making R&D in this area here. I think these are two aspects 
uh, it seemed to me quite important in terms of drawing lesson yeah. from it as well. Especially yeah, especially in places, you know, people uh, oftentimes recognize as uh, market play a very important role. I mean, even in those places, I think the government uh, investment, government intervention plays a huge role in uh, in the development of a lot of uh, uh, the disruptive technologies, uh, the yeah. new emerging technologies. Yeah, yeah. Surprisingly, where when we compare ourselves, say, with the U.S., which is often seen as a very market-oriented capitalist society, their government plays a very big role in capitalizing in funding a lot of basic research that subsequently became very commercializable. Uh, I mean, whether we talk about the internet or GPS, all those were funded by government. Uh, it was, and it was undertaken by government research entities, uh, DARPA, right? Uh, so, so I think we in Hong Kong, we really need to rethink this, not just rethink the balance between state and markets, but as Shun says, we really need to say that, you know, government is the only entity that can bear this sort of, you know, long gestation period research that can bear that risk that has that can bear that the 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 the, 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 the money is involved and has that risk appetite. And society must also, as Shun suggests, be willing to accept some failures along the way. You know, if you have if you invest in 10 projects, right? And if one succeeds, and you know, that, that's a very good rate of return. But oftentimes in this very myopic short termist kind of market-oriented system, we, we tend to view you know, uh, failures as intolerable, as uh, as displaying a lack of, uh, you know, uh, KPIs or lack of accountability. So I think we really need to rethink the, the, not just the role of the state, but you know, the 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 risks and returns that that the state should uh, should should be in, uh, involved in. Uh, I uh, unfortunately, uh, Anthony, can you hear us? Because uh, I have a question for you. Looks like Anthony can't really hear us. Uh, so, but Anthony had, had this point about, you know, we should shift our, uh, not just emphasize basic research, but also pay attention to applied research. I, I have no objections to that, but it seems to me that there is a third uh, uh, quadrant, right? Or a third way of thinking of this, uh, which is uh, that there can be basic research, which is use-oriented. Use or use inspired. Uh, many years ago, I read this book called uh, Pastures Quadrant. Uh, and it says, you know, there's this two axes on the horizontal axis, it's consideration for use. On the vertical axis, it's uh, quest for fundamental understanding. So when it's low consideration for use and it's just motivated by fundamental understanding, that's Bohr's Quadrant, right? Name after Niels Bohr, the nuclear physicist, uh, the physicist. Uh, then when it's only inspired by use, very little concern about fundamental understanding is applied research, which is what Anthony was suggesting we emphasize more. But there's a, a third quadrant, and the third quadrant there is high consideration for use and motivated by fun, quest for fundamental understanding. And that's Louis Pasteur, Lu, uh, Pasteur's quadrant. Because Pasteur di didn't just invent, Louis Pasteur di di didn't just invent the process of pasteurization for keeping milk longer. Uh, he also invented the field of, or one of, was one of the founders of the field of microbiology. So, so I, I wonder if that should inform the way we think about, you know, the kind of research government fund supports uh, and, and, and also the things about the way uh, researchers should be incentivized uh, to, 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 to the kind of research they should be channeled towards. Uh, maybe I, I'll invite uh, Professor Sharif or if, if Professor Chong can hear us, he can also, also chip in as well as Professor Wu uh, to respond. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, can you um, can you hear the comment? Oh. Okay. Yeah. 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 Maybe I think uh, I'll I'd like to uh, really uh, mention uh, one aspect of the uh, research report, which 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 we feature, uh, you know, quite prominently in terms of your conclusion here. Um, if you look at the Hong Kong uh, overall um, sort of spending. Um, you know, it's a, it's a less than one percent compared to China. Uh, it's over two percent, and the Singapore, in many places, is close to two percent. And the and the South Korea um, is over already five uh, percent. Israel is also over five percent. So, so in that sense, Hong Kong have a lot of room to grow in terms of from one percent to yeah. you know even two percent. That's double from five percent. That's five times increases here. Um, so you know, it's given it, um, appearances that you can just do anything. 
and that you know kind of just invest more money and uh, and then things will definitely become yeah. better but but i think our report suggests that uh, um, if you look at the current um, way the money is spent in research and so forth here, um, you might actually replicate uh, many times uh, the kind of uh, current situation in terms of the balance between basic research, for example, and the technology uh, transfer area here, right? You may actually end up with uh, much, much more, you know, basic research output here, but at the same time, still uh, proportionally or disproportionately, uh, the lower the number of inputs in terms of uh, innovation uh, innovation output uh, or performances in this regard. So, so I think this is uh, uh, like uh, what uh, um, Anthony mentioned, uh, uh, I think one of the points about, uh, it's about uh, not, not about uh, just making investment, but uh, to reshape, mm. uh, restructure uh, mm. the current uh, system spending. And, and that that's actually can be more important than uh, quantitatively just, you know, increase yeah. The, the volume investment here by looking at the qualitatively how do you look at uh, the balance of uh, the investment uh, more creatively by producing more you know technology innovation and technology transfer output mm, 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 mm. Uh, Nabha, would you like to chip in also yeah no i completely agree i i second and i echo what uh, my colleague has just said because uh, connecting it to your earlier question, I think that um, Hong Kong does need to do that even more so given the structural factors that it faces, the absence of a defense sector, the absence of a manufacturing. So does it have to reinvent the wheel? Um, I think yes and no. It can it can learn from other service-oriented economies like Singapore or even cities within mainland China or cities within other large countries. And to some extent, it does have to reinvent the wheel because the defense is 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 absent. Manufacturing, despite Hong Kong's efforts to reindustrialize, is probably not going to come back to the same extent. So therein lies the need, as Professor Wu mentioned, to rejig the contents of what you are doing to, to adjust to your specific situation and your specific context, which is unique. Mm. But that, that being said, it's not mm. as if no lessons can be learned from anywhere else in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I think the other context that is particularly unique to Hong Kong is that we've got this massive hinterland uh, that has a lot of manufacturing. So even though we don't have much manufacturing in Hong Kong, uh, exactly, yeah, we, we should really leverage the, yep. the 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 factory of the world next door to do that yep. kind of that sort of R and D, right? So we shouldn't exactly. Like, so we should we, we shouldn't yep. frame it so narrowly. Yeah, Hong Kong has less than one percent share of GDP in manufacturing, that's, but that's looking at it very narrowly. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and, yeah. So, if, and so if, Hong Kong, if Hong Kong sees itself as this player within the 60 million Greater Bay Area, then it's it's its position, its its uh, positioning immediately changes because it can become this locus of innovation if it considers the Greater Bay Area as indeed being the manufacturing back hub and the workshop of the world, as you just mentioned. But if we're going to be myopic and narrow-minded and parochial thinking that it's just us, 7.3 million people, 1,100 square kilometers, then of course, a calculus is dramatically shifted. Mm -hmm. Indeed so, indeed so. Uh, we've got a question from a participant, and he points out that uh, the Hong Kong government tends to fund only the initial part of R&D, in other words, the research more so than the development or the deployment. And the Hong Kong government seldom funds the operation and maintenance, the commercialization efforts, the IP processes, finding people to, you know, make use or deploy the, the research. Uh, and, and, and particularly in the construction industry that uh, this participant works in. Uh, so would, would, would you all say that that is something that needs to be addressed, that a lot more funding needs to go into the D&D, &D, right? Development and deployment of the research that has already taken place. Is that a funding gap in our system? Yeah, I would say so. I would definitely agree that that is, that is a funding gap. And, you know, I think that speaks to the naivety of Hong Kong's um, and, the, and the immaturity of Hong Kong's innovation system, that we just don't know much more than the first stages for which we are already behind, even at the most basic stages that this participant pointed out, funding basic research. Yes, we do some of that, but we're not. As if, it's not as if we're excelling in that. And then there are all these further stages that Hong Kong has to focus on. One, th one caveat that I want to add, though, is that all of this focus should 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 be circumscribed by a certain time frame or certain milestones that that have to be hit. Hong Kong government can't be expected to to always be the backstop for basic research and D and D and all of that. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done at this stage. 
we're 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 like a, a yeah. parched desert. Any water <laughs> that is given to the desert will be welcome. But uh, at the same time, we should have a longer term vision that the we want to continue to water this desert. We want to see some trees growing out of this desert. And when the trees hit some certain height or give some certain amount of fruit, and then the Hong Kong government will st- scale back. But I completely agree with this participant that not only in the construction sector, but in the property sector, in the finance sector, there is so much uh, prop tech about uh, D&D um, that needs to be to be worked on. And the Hong Kong government seems to seems to miss all of that. And that speaks to the immaturity and the low level of sophistication, not only of our policymakers, but also of our innovation ecosystem. Mm. That's a great yeah, point. I think, uh, you know, I, I agree with uh, um, uh, Navajo just mentioned, I think, uh, uh, there are, I think the support uh, the different stage of a development of this project can um, be quite important here. I think, uh, you know, one of the models uh, some of the places have used, especially in mainland China, uh, is this government-linked uh, venture uh, capital fund. I think that can be quite important. So if you just, uh, for example, rely on government to pick the project, uh, that may not necessarily uh, be the best choices because they may not have the expertise to pick the right project here. So, so you might actually have government to work with the industry players to so have these uh, kind of government-linked uh, venture capital so that they actually can work very well in terms of government can provide additional support um, for the uh, project in different stages. But at the same time, you can, um, the, you, you, you can take advantage of the expertise uh, from um, from the industry players, right? So, yeah. so 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 that the investment can be better targeted in, in terms of generating future um, um, uh, future profit or you know future growth. Yeah, yeah. It seems to me that in the UIG uh, regime or framework ecosystem that Professor Chong talks about, in Hong Kong's context, uh, we are missing two of the three pillars: right? industry, because we are services oriented economy. Uh, industry tends not to invest as much in R&D as manufacturing does. And G seems to be, as Nabha says, quite immature. Huh? Uh, the, the level of expertise is, and the level of R&D funding sophistication seems to be quite low. So it really seems when we are talking about reshaping this ecosystem, it's more than reshaping this ecosystem, it's really creating this ecosystem uh, and building it up in, 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 in a way that can sustain and produce the kind of uh, R&D uh, in an innovation system that we would like to see. Uh, but thanks, I think we're out of time, but thanks very much for doing this just before Christmas. It's a very rich, insightful topic. As, as Professor Wu says, in this, uh, and as Nabah says as well, in this patch, there's almost anything we do. <laughs> you know, when, when investments are so low, the first 100 million or $1 billion is going to yield very high uh, returns. So it's, it's, we, are, we are nowhere. I mean, I was just reflecting on the fact that the debate in Singapore is so different. The debate in Singapore seems, after all the expenditures we poured into this innovation and technology, what have we got to show for it? Right? Whereas here, the debate is very different. We, we, we clearly have not done enough. We clearly have not invested enough. And there is so much uh, growth potential and there's so much uh, potential for high returns, at least at this stage. Uh, that almost anything we do would, would uh, in, in this space would uh, yield, uh, at least in the initial years, would yield very high returns. So thank you very much uh, to our speakers and, and for doing this. Our I, I suppose this will be the last event for IEMS as well as for IPP and PPOL for the year. Thank you very much, everyone. And to our participants, thanks for staying with us till the end. And we hope to see you uh, in the new year uh, with more exciting seminars. Thank you, everyone. And have a good Christmas and a happy new year. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you participants.